Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, we may have one more panelist that will join us um, as we get things going, but just to, to get us started, uh, everybody is muted. Um, if you are using the event app, we do encourage you to check in, uh, complete the session survey, update your activities. If you have any trouble with the app, please email us at eventsatfirst.org and we're happy to help. This session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours on the app slash desktop mobile site. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Mike Murray. Thanks, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to, to virtually see everybody. Hope everybody's doing well out there in these strange times, uh, but glad we're able to, to get together and do this. As Tracy mentioned, I am the moderator for this uh, session. You won't hear too much from me. Uh, the only ask I really have is please utilize the, the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the screen to submit uh, questions for the panelists. Um, and otherwise, uh, I'd like to, to hand it over to, to Scott, Jim, Jeff, uh, and Denise will hopefully be joining us as well as Tracy mentioned. But Scott, uh, if you wanna go ahead and kick us off, it's over to you, sir, thanks. Yep, uh, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. Hello, everyone, thank you for joining the session. Uh, my name is Scott Algier. I'm the Executive Director of the Information Technology ISAC, and it's uh, great to be on this panel with, uh, with our friends Jim Lin from the Downstream Natural Gas ISAC and uh, Jeff Troy from the Aviation ISAC. So gentlemen, good morning, thank you for joining. Morning, Scott, glad to be here. Great, so Great. Jim, Perhaps we can start with you first, and if you wouldn't mind just um, talking a little bit about an example or two where collaboration within your within your members has helped uh, identify and, and stop attacks. Uh, well, sure. I um, in in thinking about this uh, prior to our session, the one thought that first came to my mind was back when NotPetya was first uh, released. Uh, we have some participants. Um, and some allied partners in Europe, and they had tipped us off to Petya before it really started to hit the US. And we felt like we were able to um, communicate to our community on an early side that that was coming. And I think that was, was valuable. It was one of the first things that came to my mind thinking about this. Yeah, thank you, James. So can you explain real quick, um, I should have asked you to do this before we start, kicked off, real quickly, who, who's your membership? So what is the Downstream National Gas ISAC? Sure, and I should have done that too, I'm sorry, Scott. So, um, and I'm, I'm Jim Lynn, I'm the Executive Director for the Downstream Natural Gas ISAC. Um, our, our membership uh, comprise of uh, natural gas distribution companies, so that'd be natural gas utility companies in the United States and in Canada and also natural gas pipelines in the United States and Canada. So that's the universe of our membership. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Jeff, um, same two questions to you. So what is your ISAC? And uh, give you give an example or two as to how you add value to your members. Great, so uh, thanks. Uh, the Aviation ISAC is a global nonprofit. So we have members on five different continents and they make up uh, all the different industrial segments that are part of the aviation ecosystem. So we have air framers, we have the suppliers that build equipment that goes into an airplane. Uh, we have airlines, airports, satellite providers. Um, we have uh, air navigation service providers and other service companies that support the aviation industry. So um, thinking of, the, uh, of an example here of, of where uh, the members have really helped the, the members, we had uh, an incident where um, a nation state was trying to get into um, an airline's uh, networks and, and actually penetrated it. Uh, probably one of the most interesting things that we learned from that was the reason that they were there was to actually use the airline's systems uh, to be able to track individuals. Um, so that's, uh, you know, much different motivation than you see when someone's trying to steal intellectual property, for example, or try and do a uh, ransomware event, something along those lines. So when that uh, event happened, the member uh, shared that they were uh, working on the incident response and another member company uh, was familiar with that group that was in their network. 
because of uh, an event that they had. Uh, so we were able to hook two of our members up who um, we had one, you know, going through an incident response and one who was already experienced dealing with that uh, particular adversary. And so they actually collaborated to the point where, um, and these these companies are competitors typically, uh, but they were comp- uh, collaborating in terms of the cybersecurity teams. Uh, they actually flew one of the cybersecurity analysts over to the other uh, company's uh, headquarters to be able to work with their team and uh, completed the incident response. And then afterwards, uh, the company that suffered that attack actually did a presentation to the entire ISAC. um, And they went through their root cause analysis. And that actually led to several of the members reprioritizing their projects with Active Directory. Uh, because they had learned uh, how Active Directory had been compromised as a part of that attack. And it led to, uh, again, a lot of great work uh, being done and reprioritized to prevent uh, that group from being able to have the same impact at another member. Yeah, so that's really interesting, Jeff. Thank you. So they were after, they were on the network looking for information about a specific traveler or a set of travelers, which is really interesting. Yes. Yep. That's interesting. So um, the, the IT ISAC, uh, the Information Technology Information Sharing and Analysis Center, were similar to Jeff's and um, Jim's organizations in the sense that we're a nonprofit organization. We also accept uh, members uh, from the United States and outside of the companies outside of the United States as well. Um, but tr- most, many of our companies, most of them are the traditional uh, information technology companies. Uh, but we've also uh, include companies who have leveraged information technology for core business processes, such as um, uh, food and agriculture companies. Um, as one example, um, we have several food and agriculture companies who are members of our board as well. So the one of the examples I was uh, prepared to talk about today was um, something uh, that one of our larger member companies said so there's a, a little bit of a, a misperception, I think, that only small companies can benefit from information sharing organizations. Those larger companies have a lot of the capa- have um, more mature, and more robust capabilities. But one of the examples um, that I was going to be sharing today talked about a, a one of our larger member companies uh, came across a suspicious IP, a geo located outside of the United States that they weren't really sure what it was, right? It's one of those instances where an analyst had a you know, this doesn't look right moments. So they looked at this IP, did some research on it themselves, couldn't find much on it, couldn't find anything on it. So they sent it off to us and asked us, hey, can you um, uh, can you do some research uh, on this for us? So we leveraged the other members that we have along with other partners and we were able to uh, link this IP address to a DHS report from um, uh, related to heart bleed, right? So it was a, um, uh, we were then able to confirm that the IP address that was shared with us was malicious and was uh, related to the heart bleed expert. So in, in that instance, we had a member company who was just not sure what this IP was, felt as though it wasn't, it wasn't right, didn't, um, you know, didn't look right. And lo and behold, it find, finds out that it's, uh, it's uh, there, there's a heart bleed expert. So they were associated with the heart bleed expert. So they were now then able to identify what this was. You know, they got more information about heart bleed and were able to uh, lock down uh, lock down their network. So um, I think those are you know some pretty good examples uh, that we've talked about about how the collaboration um, it's a it's a it's a real thing and it has real value. So. Um, Jim, let's go back to you real quick. You know, are, are, is this one-off information sharing, is or is this you know everyone? I think it's easy to come up with an example, or but is this something that happens? Um, sharing within your organization on operational issues, is this a um, routine occurrence where organizations are sharing, and how else do how do members share? That's a good question, Scott. And uh, to be honest with you, we're, we're one of the newer ISECs. We've been around for six years. And what I've seen is um, most commonly the folks that share are the ones that feel comfortable sharing with the, or with the, uh, the community. And the, the ones that have participated the longest have the greatest comfort level in sharing. 
Um, and I think that other, I've heard that from other uh, ISACs as well. Uh, in our case, I would say that uh, the participant sharing is far less than broader sharing, like sharing from government or analyst reports. Um, but it, it does it does happen. It's something we've got to encourage on a regular basis. Yeah, thank you. So, how do you get your members to share? Do you do you have a platform? Do you do you have phone calls? Uh, how do you build a comfort level for to get members to share? Uh, that's also a great question. So, we do have a, a threat intel platform that's uh, secured that people share with, and uh, that that's uh, how they 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 post and they get their information. The platform also has a a mobile application that they can use. Uh, to both receive and post information, which is used very heavily by participants. Um, the, uh, and and th these are both, these are all secure platforms. Uh, our community uh, meets through trade association uh, work that's done on an annual basis. And, uh, and many of the participants have very close ties through that. So that's what encourages them to share. Uh, but there's there's some that are sort of outliers that aren't as uh, as comfortable sharing, and um, the 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 phone meetings and the in person meetings is really what fosters the sharing. Sure, thank you, sir. And uh, Jeff, I guess the same set of questions to you. And you know, one th one thing about the aviation industry is obviously there's a lot of safety regulations that companies need to need to uh, comply with. So being in a regulated industry, how does that impact the sharing among the members? Uh, good, good question. So we have uh, several different communities that we have uh, in order to kind of make the sharing as effective as possible. So uh, similar to what Jim mentioned with respect to a portal, uh, you know, we have biweekly telephone calls, for example, where people have conversations. Um, we have uh, the ability to request information from other members. So instead of just contributing intelligence information, you may actually be eliciting a best practice when you're dealing with a project or something that you're, you're trying to get some help on. Um, so as I said, we have these different communities. So we have a threat intelligence community, and then it has uh, some working groups to help companies uh, to be able to get more specific conversations about the issue they're addressing, a threat actors, a fraud working group, something along those lines. We also have working groups for network security architects and for product security specialists and for compliance folks. And so when it comes to issues, particularly like compliance, it's really become a driver for cybersecurity across our industry anyway. Um, we have PII because we have passenger information, for example, we have lots of people getting credit card information, um, et cetera. So when all of that uh, 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 new laws come out that have to be complied with. And, and you see a lot of that going on in Europe right now. So the GDPR, I'm sure people are familiar with that. Uh, but they're also actually creating um, requirements that you have an information security management system if you're a company related to the aviation industry in Europe. So uh, and typically you see compliance rules get started in one part of the world and then they flow across the rest of the world. So uh, each of these different working groups is really the way that uh, we get a lot of information um, shared with more folks who are all supporting the entire um, CISO role at their companies. Um, I think an, another thing that's really important is, uh, except for COVID, right, we typically get together four times a year in person. Um, there's a question I can see in, in the chat there about, you know, um, trust. And to us, uh, the biggest part of building that trust is to actually get people together uh, to share, um, you know, a beer after a meeting uh, so you can, you know, get to know people uh, better because the more those relationships happen where people really know each other, the more comfortable they're going to be um, sharing information to uh, help each other out, you know, in these different, uh, these different types of uh, responses that we have. Yeah, so thanks for that. Um... Jeff, you know, um, appreciate the reminder too about the questions. If you do have a question, please submit them in into the uh, through the Q Q and A function. So, um, you know, I'll just say real quickly for the ITI SAC, um, 
the trust issue is you know is a big one, right? Or we 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 um, we have a lot of competitors who are who are competing in the market in the market space. But what we've done, I think, is we've broken broken up a big membership into smaller chunks. So we're trying to get companies together around communities of interest, um, or get them to to discuss um, you know areas that they have in common. Uh, but also we're We've been working uh, for several years now on making the business case as to why it's important to share, how sharing adds value to your organization, talking about you know, when you contribute the information you get back and how it helps uh, and how it helps um, secure your enterprise and how participating in a, a collaborative information sharing organizations really is a sound risk management activity and a force multiplier to a organization's internal security teams. Nobody has the budget, especially these days, to hire all of the security analysts they want. Nobody has the, the, the money to get all of the security tools that, that, that they want. Um, so you're, for a uh, engaging in a membership um, organization, information sharing organization, it gives you access to analysts from peer companies who are dealing with the same problems that you have and maybe have already um, got, got found solutions to problems you're, you're, you're dealing with. So uh, one of the things in addition to the indicator sharing and the, the, the using the platforms that that Jim, Jeff uh, have spoken about, I, I also want to make sure we don't lose track of the um, collaboration and the, the, the analyst analyst peer to peer exchange that goes on through uh, it used to be when I started with the ITI SAC, I guess it's about 15 years and 15 years ago now. Um, the, it was a slow um, drip of information coming in. Um, I, and now we, we have this opposite problem where there's we can share indicators at scale now where there's there's you know the 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 the, the problem isn't a shortage of indicators. The problem is a, a making sense of what's coming in. So engaging in an information sharing organization can help, can help you do that. So we have um, some questions coming up here in, in the chat. So are we generally know that search, C search are established following one or more major incidents? How were your ISACs started? So um, Jim, or maybe we'll go to you for that. You did mention that you're one of the newer ISACs. So what was the impetus for your ISAC coming together? Um, well, that's a good question. The uh, the oil and natural gas subsector of the energy sector saw a need for information sharing prior to the ISAC. Um, and I work for the American Gas Association uh, as my main job. This is part of my job there. Uh, we, we were sending out email alerts to folks on um, timely issues and they were realizing that they weren't getting to the right people, they weren't getting through, et cetera. So um, that was really the impetus for developing the ISAC. Uh, specifically, there's actually two ISACs developed. Um, there's also an oil ISAC, which is geared predominantly towards the petroleum industry. Um, uh, so we, we have those two pieces that we cover and that's where it started from. Thank you for that, uh, Jeff. Um, aviation. So the aviation ISAC grew out of a uh, working group. Actually, uh, the working group had been getting together a very small number of members in the community. I think about seven or eight uh, member companies that are that are now founding members of the aviation ISAC. Uh, they really felt uh, that. Uh, such a small group, although it was effective for that, that small group uh, needed broader input and really a better view of the entire threat landscape across the industry. So that drove us to, um, you know, expand that working group out into a, into an ISAC and, you know, make this more formal with a platform and uh, getting more, more input. Super, and for the IT ISAC, we were formed in 2000, uh, shortly after the PDD 63 in 1998, uh, that called for the establishment of sector-specific information sharing organizations. Um, so we're, we were uh, you know, formed almost immediately after that. So um, our, our impetus was you know, showing industry, voluntary industry collaboration and coordination um, you know, in, in after the light of um, the Marsh Commission report and then PDD 63 and President Clinton. 
Um, so we have a couple more questions in the in the in the queue here. So let's go through those. Um, would you guys be willing to share more about exact platforms you're use, using, um, or um, so within the ITI stack, we're we're using uh, TrueStar Intelligence Management Platform. Uh, we've been using that for our um, automated indicator sharing. So we every indicator we get goes into that platform and. Uh, we can build reports in the platform that we can share to members, and members have the ability to um, use Stixaxi API to um, um, to um, um, to pull that information out. So, um, Jeff, would you like to tackle that one? Yep. So we use uh, the Sultra uh, tool for automated indicator exchange, but I would like to highlight that uh, automated indicator exchange is not something that uh, a lot of our members anyway are really excited about. I mean, they like to have the functionality, but uh, as we look at it, it's not used too much. Uh, there's a lot of noise in automated indicator sharing. And so uh, companies are trying to find a real balance between using that capability and not um, really flooding the screens of their detect analysts with uh, bad intel. So. I think there is uh, still a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, figuring out how automated indicator sharing works best. Uh, but as I said, we use Sultra now and we're actually in the process of looking at uh, MISP and either making both uh, available to our, to our members or uh, adopting uh, one. But right now MISP is uh, something that we're taking a look at. It's very popular over in Europe. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, Jeff. That the automated in, uh, automated sharing is not for everyone, and um, it's, you know, you do if you can't handle the amount of indicators, you can get quickly overwhelmed with indicator overload. Um, it's, and especially if you're small uh, small company who doesn't have the technology platforms to ingest, or even um, you know, if you don't have a uh, the capability to receive um, or pull indicators in, it's not much use to you either, right? So, um, Jim, are you uh, able to talk about what you use? Uh, yeah, we, we use the Cyware platform, um, which we've used for the last year. It replaced a custom developed platform, which was not very user friendly. And we saw very little participation. In the last year, our participation has jumped several hundred percent just because people are participating where they weren't participating at all before. Um, so that that's helped a lot. And we found that that platform has worked quite well for us. Super, thank you. So I think this next question gets to where we were talking about um, earlier about uh, different maturity levels. So we, we're all members of the National Council of ISACs, which has 24 or so member organizations. Um, so we were, the question here is what is um, the gaps in maturity among ISACs? Um, and Max, my view on this, I've been with the National Council of ISACs, I think the longest, is that we seem to make it work, right? So no ISAC is the same. We all have different um, levels of capability and our members have different levels of capability, but we're all designed to meet the needs of our members. So within the National Council of ISACs, I think what we try to do is we, we focus on providing analytic reports across the membership uh, and requests for information so that we're not drowning each other in indicators and we're, we're providing summaries of what we feel is important. And then those are able to be consumed by, by you know, all of our member, uh, member ISACs. So um, unless Jim or Jeff, you have anything to add, we're, we are short on time and we have two more questions. So I don't, I'll, I'll pause to see if either of you have anything else to add there. I'm good. Okay, so um, many countries have sector level C search. Are ISACs complementary? How do you work together with your with your, with your respective sector C search? So who wants to tackle this? I'd be happy to know what a C search is. Sure. So C search, uh, Computer Security Incident Response Team, is yep. um, what I go by. Right. Uh, so in the United States, uh, there are uh, government, you know, the United States government set up 
uh, the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Now it's up to 17. Um, and so the government has their agencies. So you'll find the Department of Homeland Security has CISA now. And the Aviation ISAC, along with a couple of other ISACs, actually have people who go to work each day uh, to CISA Central, which is uh, the uh, former NCIC, and they uh, basically represent the sector there so that they can provide information and get information for the sector. So several sectors work along those lines. Uh, some people don't, some sectors don't have anybody going there every single day, but they have them, you know, reporting in uh, in order to keep that, that contact. Uh, over in Europe, there is a uh, kind of a renewed initiative right now to start to create ISACs. And so there's a lot of work being done um, in the European Union as they investigate exactly how ISACs work and try to find uh, uh, ways to overcome some real challenges uh, in the European Union when it comes to information sharing, because there's 24 countries in there and it's uh, very difficult uh, in order for them to uh, get documents approved that meet the information sharing uh, requirements of all the different members. Super. Um, excellent. Um, Jim, anything to add on that, sir? Um, you know, we uh, the Access to that is requires security clearances, which um, are sometimes are not the easiest to get in the United States. Um, but we've had some trouble with security clearances with our ISAC. But uh, we, we participate very closely, not so much at, at that level, but uh, our sector specific agency, which is a, a, a US based term, would be the Department of Energy. And they convene a monthly uh, call uh, uh, for uh, analysts within the three uh, energy ISACs, the electric ISAC, our ISAC, and the oil ISAC. And that's a great opportunity to hear presentations from them on what's current and also uh, for us to share what we're seeing and dialogue about that. And that's been very productive. Great, thank you. And then um, in the final minute or so that we have, I think we can get to this last question, which is how do ISACs uh, use face-to-face -face meetings, right? Uh, how, how do they work given that there are hundreds or thousands of uh, people participating in these organizations in, in ISACs? So, um, we have not had an ISAC meeting um, uh, since inception, but as I mentioned, uh, the uh, the organizations that, that feed into the ISAC, the American Gas Association, the Canadian Gas Association, and the International um, uh, um, Gas Association of America, those those would be uh, the, the three organizations that feed into us. They do meet, and when they meet, there's typically a DNG ISAC report and people do chat with one another. Uh, that, that's the context for people to be in person with one another uh, so far. Uh, that's at least our experience, which may be different from other ISACs. Super. Uh, Jeff, you guys, um, how do you guys handle this? First of all, I would love to have this problem with uh, hundreds and thousands of member organizations. We don't, <laughs> uh, we don't have that many people that, that, that are members. I mean, we have several hundred um, analysts, but in terms of member companies, you know, we don't, we're not into the, the hundreds and hundreds. Um, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned, the fact that we have created uh, working groups uh, and parsed our communities so that the people who are specializing in particular issues can find those folks who are uh, working those same problems makes it a lot more effective as, a, as an association. And so if you're a network security architect, for example, you can just engage with the network security architecture working group. Uh, what we do in that working group though, uh, is we bring in the intelligence analysts every so many meetings and they'll do an intelligence briefing. Uh, so that group can be up to speed on what's happening with the intelligence and not necessarily have to try and follow the intelligence um, streams every single day. So trying to find ways, you know, where we can matrix the different skill sets and then just make sure that you're spending most of your time in, in the area that's most interest to you seems to work well. Yeah. And then to, I'll close out by saying that there are, there are ISACs that do all uh, annual meetings, in-person meet, annual meetings, uh, and they turn them into conferences as well, where they invite members and non-members, and then they have member-only sessions. And, um, you know, they make, uh, you know, they have lots of people show up to those, um, and which is, uh, you know, which is a good benefit for them. So there are 
ways to turn these, um, you know, these build trust through these annual meetings or smaller breakout sessions, you know, booze cruises and those type of events where they, you can get your members together and get them in smaller groups and build that trusted community. So that's, um, that's it for us. Uh, we've exceeded our time. I want to thank everyone for, for um, letting us be here. Uh, thank you for attending our session. Thank you to the, uh, Tracy, Grace, the, and the first organizers for all the work that they've done to make this event possible under these circumstances and for inviting us to be part of it. So th thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff, uh, Jim, and, and Mike, we turn it back over to you, sir. Uh, I was just going to do the same thing you just did, Scott. Thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your insights and lessons from uh, developing and maturing these ISAC organizations here in the States and hopefully some good tidbits of information for others to take back and, uh, and implement as well. Thanks again and uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank